so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, love spells and grimoires, uh, or love spells in Norwegian grimoires and folk tradition, uh, which is an aft topic because, of course, yesterday was uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, yeah, if you, I hope you had a nice Valentine's Day yesterday. And if you didn't, then, uh, well, we can see if we can do something about that, can't we? Uh, so all of this uh, is, uh, you know, uh, based on this, uh, well, well, all of this started kind of uh, by the fact that I was running a podcast, I was running kind of a blog, um, again, exploring uh, the stuff that I'm interested in, which is, you know, Old Norse and uh, ancient Scandinavian, you know, culture and its legacy, um, especially kind of the stuff that I found, you know, intriguing and strange and that might not be communicated uh, very usually uh, otherwise. But I wanted to make less stuff that was online and just reliant on, you know, devices and 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 access to internet and stuff like that. I wanted to make tangible things that people could could hold, you know. Uh, so I started trying to see if I could make some books and publications. So uh, so far, I've released a magazine called The Fool's Mirror, which is a you know kind of a I don't know, like magical realist, uh, Scandi futurist lifestyle magazine is what I call it. Uh, but that was preceded by, uh, by this little thing, uh, which, uh, I'm sure that some audience members might already have. Um, this, uh, my first, uh, book, Love Spells and Erotic Sorcery in Norwegian Folk Magic, which I, uh, where I curated a bunch of charms and, uh, spells from the Norwegian, uh, material. And, uh, yeah, just got them all together, uh, in a nice little curation, uh, put it in a, in a book that fits in your back pockets or something like that. And, uh, to do with as you please, uh, I deliberately wanted to, uh, it to have kind of the same ambiguities as, um, as the original material, uh, which, uh, which is going to be, uh, apparent as we go along that that is often quite oftentimes quite ambiguous uh and complicated just like so many other things in life but we're talking about uh folk magic today um folk magic can be hard to pin down um if we go to the next slide um we can see you know take a quick look at some of the general categories of sources that we're dealing with here um the first thing I want to address there, of course, is that uh, we have um, popular motifs about sorcery, superstitions, legends, uh, all sorts of stuff that may or may not reflect actual practice. This also includes, especially in modern times, um, popular culture. Um, you know, how, say, sorcerers and magicians are portrayed, often tied to um, what sort of people we like to think that sorcerers are. Um, and uh, then, of course, you have uh, vernacular practices and oral tra oral transmission, which is, of course, uh, in a culture that uh, that may not may be more or less literate, but maybe the majority of the people cannot read or write. That's, of course, how like most magical traditions or uh, you know all sorts of lore and culture is going to be communicated, right? Uh, our sources for this are mostly ethnographic surveys, uh, folk life literature, occasional physical remnants. Um, and this one thing that is worth bearing in mind here is that we're kind of reliant on, uh, you know, people informing us about these sorts of things. And uh, especially when we're talking about like after the Industrial Revolution or uh, even like as late as the um, like 1900s. Um, people are very acutely aware of what is old fashioned and what is modern, and they often do not want to say stuff or, you know, they, they don't want to be put in a light that makes them seem superstitious or that they feel is exploitative or, or, you know, makes them seem kind of old fashioned. So oftentimes we will see people distancing themselves from the material by saying, well, this is something that people used to do, but they don't do anymore, really. This is something that my grandparents' generation did. And, I don't know anybody who does this now. Uh, we kind of have to trust them when they say that, but we know for a fact that that is not always true because people will um, avoid uh, attaching things to their person that could incriminate them. Not necessarily even, you know, because it was, you know, 
a risk of persecution or anything like that. It's just that, you know, they don't want it tied to their name. Mm -hmm. um, this is quite different often from the third category, which is written magic and literary transmission, because then we can sometimes get the unvarnished um, reality, even though this comes with specific caveats as well. You know, the, uh, what is um, distributed among, you know, young women, maybe uh, in, uh, in rural Scandinavia, might not be the same topics that people who are writing books of magic are interested in. Um, sometimes there's an overlap, but sometimes, you know, that there might not be that much. And we do see that uh, also in the material that I uh, put in the book, that sometimes uh, there's, uh, there are differences in, in the material um, uh, in, in that regard. And also, uh, maybe, you know, interestingly also uh, in terms of gender and kind of perspectives, uh, like in terms of like agency. Uh, passive versus active and, and stuff like that. Uh, but with written magic, we're talking, of course, about often magical texts such as, you know, grimoires. Um, and grimoires, if we go to the next slide, uh, have a very interesting tradition in Scandinavia. Uh, in Norway, they're often called uh, collectively svaktebøker, or black books. Um, black books are often in legends referred to almost as if they are there is only one black book you know there is the black book um and certain people are rumored to be in possession of the black book that may or may not be true uh but also the physical uh manuscripts well the legends and the physical manuscripts also often make claims or allegations about uh their nature or origins um we have this idea of course that uh that uh Magical texts such as these are tied to black magic and blasphemy and the devil and stuff like that. And that that is an element, but that runs the risk. Uh, that's part of the mythology, rather. Like it, it does run the risk of simplifying things a little bit more, uh, because uh, oftentimes in the actual folk tradition, what people, regular people, thought that the black book was uh, was that it was. Uh, pieces of the Bible or other religious texts that were kept out of public knowledge uh, for uh, our own good, basically, because uh, regular people, or especially wicked people, uh, cannot be trusted with this sort of stuff. And so there's like, this is powerful stuff, it's dangerous. Uh, certain people uh, are better, better suited for this kind of information than others. Uh, uh, so here we can see um, a manuscript from the 1790s. It claims to be older than it is. It says 1699. Um, it's called Cyprianus, uh, the um, like the all over the world uh, famous uh, black artist. So it's like a sorcerer, warlock, uh, blah 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 blah. And it says uh, printed in Stavanger. That's in so southwest Norway in 1699. There are no printed black books uh, in Scandinavia <laughs> until we started releasing editions uh, a few decades ago, like or like in the past century, uh, for scholarly purposes. Uh, they claim to be written, like copied off of printed books, uh, to create the impression uh, of legitimacy uh, in, uh, you know, uh, after you know the printed books have been introduced uh, to the world. Um, and uh, it's interesting here, Cyprianus, of course, is, uh, is um, uh, St. Cyprian of Antioch, who is one of the early church fathers, uh, who in the medieval period was also imagined to be a powerful sorcerer. Um, so here there is uh, not so much kind of, you know, that kind of dark uh, origin for it. Uh, it's, uh, it portrays itself more as being something that is of... Uh, uh, of, of the same power that that gives uh, um, um, the clergy the power to do good. And uh, yeah, so the self mythology surrounding the black books, uh, how they portray themselves is often very like, it sets a very high expectation straight from the start. But the reality is that most of them are eclectic scrapbooks uh, from a time when the differences between superstition and um, science were not very clear. Uh, so in any given uh, grimoire, and no two grimoires are really the same, 
you'll find a combination of uh, uh, just tips and tricks and kind of, uh, you know, just practical advice for, I don't know, catching fish, um, recipes to make explosives, uh, recipes to, uh, um, to take the puppies from a large dog breed and, and creating lap dogs out of it by, well, feeding it alcohol, for example, or um, different uses for, uh, for moles, like the animal, the mole, like turning moles into powder. But they also have, um, you know, the, it, yeah, it challenges our notion of what magic is, right? But to these people, they're, you know, this is just kind of a wide category of unobvious know-how some of which is of a supernatural nature which could include uh, lists of fortunate or unfortunate days it could be uh, prayers prayers that are not found in the bible that recount uh, an alternative stories about christ or something like that or rhyming charms a very old uh, category of charm that goes all the way back to the early middle ages at least and sometimes back to classical antiquity um and there yeah it's a it's a it's an ancient and medieval tradition that continues into modernity and uh you you might be actually surprised that uh, uh kind of the tradition that inherits uh this tradition of scandinavian grimoires is not you know um you know black magicians and people you know you know wicked evildoers uh, a lot of the contents of these uh continued straight into uh the the collections of uh, scandinavian faith healers uh in the in the countryside so you know christian evan evangelicals and and so on but yeah actually if we go to the next slide we can learn a little bit about uh who was oh before we get there uh this is the oldest uh so-called black book from norway it's called uh, vinnie Buka. was found under the floorboards of vinnie church uh, in the 1700s, um, and the book itself is from somewhere between the late 1400s to the early 1500s. We know that uh, the paper was probably produced uh, in the 1480s or something like that. Uh, when it's closed, it's no bigger than a credit card, so you can take it with you, and it's it's very discreet. Um, next page. Yeah. So, who owned the black books? Uh, originally, it seems to have been uh, the higher strata of society, military officers, uh, nobility, maybe merchants. Um, but in Norway, there is a very strong uh, tradition of associating the black book with clergy uh, to such a strong degree, actually, that um, uh, in Telemark, for instance, there are there are priests uh, who write letters of kind of expressing annoyance at the fact that uh that the peasantry just assumes they take it for granted that if you have that kind of clerical education uh that you are kind of a man of god and a man of of the book that you know more uh than your lord's prayer that you know um you know about other tips and tricks for all sorts of things as well and charms that can help you in all sorts of situations um so there's a widespread assumption among the peasantry that uh, that uh, priests can function basically as magicians as well in the 15 and 1600s this changes a little bit later on uh when uh, there was there were efforts to teach the peasantry to to read and uh, increase literacy so that they could well primarily um, educate themselves in biblical matters uh, read prayers uh, sing hymns at home and stuff like that um and uh naturally of course uh, knowledge about other things increased in the general populace as well and uh, these black books uh, become more attainable and in fact most uh, most of the grimoires we have are from the period after these efforts you know started getting uh, you know bearing fruit and and more people started learning um learning how to uh, how to read and write so then you probably have a widespread tradition among the peasantry of um, of certain people you know the eccentric kind of cunning man in your village or or cunning woman um 
borrowing magical literature from each other, copying down the stuff that they're interested in, or adding stuff of their own, stuff that they've been told or heard in their tradition. And 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 we get kind of, I don't know, like a little renaissance of, of, of this kind of written magic. But initially, uh, clergy were probably um, a big portion of the people who owned the original books. And, uh, and one of these would perhaps be Petodas, who's a very famous Norwegian uh, priest and uh, author of hymns and poems, uh, many of which are still sung in Norwegian churches today. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, you know, goes down in Norwegian folklore as one of the of the big like black book clergyman who allegedly during his uh uh during his uh education in uh, Germany uh took uh, night classes uh, from the from the evil one himself and through his uh through his own cunning and uh, his own kind of uh intellect managed to fool the devil this is all also cent central here you fool uh, less than sacred powers uh, into doing um, doing good. So uh, apparently he did very badly at his exams and the devil uh, said that he would take the soul of whoever made it last at his exams. And uh, so when he um, when the devil confront confronted him, Petr Das, uh, Petr Das uh, outsmarted him by saying, well, I'm I'm actually not the last one. That's the last one. And then he pointed at his shadow. And after that, uh, it is said that Petra Das never cast a shadow ever again. Um, probably go to the next slide. Another uh, important uh, member of the Norwegian church uh, who is central to our story is uh, Dr. Anton Christian Bang, uh, who in the early 1900s uh, collected all of the charms available to him uh, and all, all of the black books and all of the um, the magic he could get from folk uh, art, like folk life literature, uh, and he created this massive compilation of charms and spells called Norske Hexaformlago or Magisk Opskrifta, which means Norwegian witches' formulas and magical recipes. Um, he did this intending it to be studied uh, by the church and by theologians uh, as, as a means of understanding, as he what he thought to be uh, kind of the darker shadow of Norwegian spiritual life, um, but he took care to uh, omit some of the things that he thought were particularly bad. Uh, we know what these are, of course, because these are still in their original manuscripts, but he did not include them in his book, uh, which is interesting because some of the stuff that he did include is is, is still pretty, uh, pretty intense, to put it that way. Um, I did not include all of the, you know, the worst examples uh, in this talk, but uh, yeah, if you want there, there are some 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 shocking things uh, here in in my own book. So, yeah, enough about that. I think we can probably get into uh, the meat of it because we're talking about like not all of these uh, spell books deal with uh, with love. Um, different uh, black books uh have different contents and they reflect the owners to a very large degree uh, we see for instance that a lot of the the spells that deal with magic and um, contraception and uh, you know um, spells to seduce people are often also books that are interested in combat magic making yourself invisible um, impervious to bullets stuff like that or party tricks winning it dice games so we're pretty confident that some of those books uh, um, are um, of a category that was probably popular and passed around in the military circles among officers or something like that. Of course, um, owning such manuscripts was not illegal in itself, but witchcraft was. So there, you're walking a fine line uh, in the early modern period uh, by possessing these. You could probably allege that you just have it out of curiosity or something for your little curiosity cabinet. Uh, but uh, um, getting caught actually using some of this stuff was probably not uh, okay uh, in this in that day and age. Um, there are, we're going to start out with kind of um, with a category that uh, deals with uh, divining lovers. There are four different um, uh, categories uh, of um, 
of, of magic that I, I used uh, in, in my book here. It's kind of an arbitrary collection here, but um, I started out uh, with, uh, with a chapter uh, which deals with uh, divining lovers, so identifying uh, a future spouse, for instance. Um, and the second one uh, is uh, to, to secure a, li a love interest. Uh, that is what is called hugvending in Norwegian, which means literally turning of mind or turning of desire. Uh, hug can mean either or. Um, and then uh, the third uh, chapter is about uh, disenchanting, you know, uh, getting rid of uh, spells and curses or falling out of love, which unsurprisingly is not something that these uh, books especially deal with very, uh, very often, but we'll get to that later. Um, and then the fourth and final chapter is about all of the other stuff that didn't fit, fit neatly into either um, uh, category. So uh, contraceptions, dealing with impotence or, or um, illnesses, to put it uh, put it that way and uh, and just about anything you could probably imagine uh, but yeah if we go to the next slide what's interesting about uh, the spells that deal with divining a lover is that uh, here we see a much more explicit degree of feminine agency and uh, also what's interesting is that a lot of these um, it's not always strictly the, strictly true but um, these, to a larger degree, uh, come from folk life literature and not necessarily uh, grimoires uh, as such. Um, and so they take the form of kind of, uh, um, how should I say, games uh, with mystical characteristics that you might play uh, as a child or adolescent. And uh, it reflects kind of this, um, this attitude, it seems, that... Uh, that women are um, women kind of receive um, um, love interests uh, and are so kind of they're kind of passive to being picked out by um, by a, somebody courting them or something like that. So while I'm sure that a lot of young men were interested in you know knowing who they would be you know getting married to or whatever. Um, a lot of these seem to assume that they, you know, these are girls doing this. Um, they want to see if their future husband is uh, handsome, if he is lazy, or if he, you know, if he has a good work ethic, if he's a drunkard, stuff like that. And a lot of them deal with dreams like this one uh, to lay on dream grass from uh, Flo Hallingdal in 1989. Uh, so the girl fasts an entire day. In the evening, she forges uh, in the meadow for three, four, and five-leafed clovers and puts them in, in her hymn book as she holds it behind her back. Uh, and this is a significant detail here. Uh, if they are on the page of a funeral hymn, her sweetheart is dying. So there, that might be botched from the start in that case. Uh, then she goes to an empty house that she has not slept in before. Here, she lays down in silence with her hymn book under her head. She counts the rafters before she goes to sleep. In dreams, she will then see uh, her future husband and him she must take, whether she likes him or not. Uh, next slide. Here's another variation, but in this case, um, a, a likeness of the person actually appears physically. <clears throat> uh, one or more girls deck a table in a solitary chamber or outbuilding put food on, uh, and a bowl of ale on the table and sit by it, fasting all day without speaking a word. In the eve, one will hear a wheeze like a strong wind. The door will open and a likeness, of him, uh, a likeness enter of him whom the girl shall have. She offers him a toast. If he drinks, it will be a good husband. If he does not, a bad one. In some variations of this, they have a selection of drinks and... Uh, his qualities will be judged depending on what he drinks, uh, if he is temperate or, you know, stuff like that. Um, next slide. So here it's interesting. This is one uh, where um, it's presumed that it's a, it's a man or boy uh, doing this. Stand by crossroads on St. John's night. Uh, that's kind of Norwegian equivalent to Midsummer. 
Um, then one will see the woman who uh, woman one is to get married to passing by. So I think what some of these uh, are tied to is uh, general Scandinavian um, ideas about premonitions. Uh, the idea that uh, that someone has kind of a spirit that may or may not look like themselves, and so you may see people, you know, coming into a room before they actually arrive, but you didn't see that person; you saw uh, saw their spirit. Um, and I think that this is kind of like an analogy to that. You're kind of hacking the system a little bit uh, to see you know, your future spouse arriving before they actually arrive or something like that, it's proverbially. So it's a, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but I like to, I like to imagine that there is a vague connection here between these different ideas. Uh, next slide. To see one's forthcoming spouse, Voss, 1887. On Yule Eve, you must make, uh, you make a bundle of your own uh, everyday clothes and put them in your bed in, the, in on the hayloft. At seven or eight in the morning, you are to go and see if someone is laying in the bed. If you see a dressed person in the bed, you will get married in the coming year. If nobody is there, you will get married later. If it is a skeleton, you will never marry. Next slide. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was some of the divination uh, charms. They, many of them are kind of variations of, of this kind of thing. You do something uh, in order to receive concealed knowledge. Um, the second uh, chapter uh, of my book, which deals with um, um, seducing or manipulating people <laughs> or like uh, making, making feelings mutual or something like that, uh, tends, uh, tends to be a, more of a masculine uh, sort. And, uh, and yeah, um, they're often governed by these ideas of, uh, of correspondences. Well, that's also like this magical stuff, generally speaking, that they think things that uh, are associated with uh, certain body parts, for instance, um, have uh, conducive properties to, uh, to, yeah, to that, you know, by analogy. So here, uh, in this case, pluck a feather on the outermost part of the rump. I presume of a rooster, it does not specify, as he is mating with a hen. Let that feather not touch the ground. Carry it with you in secret. The woman you want, you shall stroke on the mouth with this feather. She will love you immediately. Next slide. To awaken love. Brew flowers, leaves, stalk, and root of love grass uh, into a beverage. This awakens love in the one who drinks it, albeit a love that will end in hate. So this is another thing. Uh, sometimes with, you know, uh, you know, as we saw with some of the divination things, you, you, you can do some of these things, but the spell also uh, warns that, you know, if you do this, it might not actually have the best results long term. Um, and sometimes spells are deliberately risky or they are or they have some other elements that make them difficult to perform or unlikely or something like that so that there's you know there's no it doesn't come cheap you know that's i think that's what they're trying to say here uh next slide so this is a very common category of charm there are tons of them uh, where you take uh, yeah well in this case you uh, read these words into a tankard of ale and breathe into it, then you shall be loved. So you take, uh, take the tankard, presumably at a drinking party or something like that, and you say, Milkefe quisen kunt quara ligiami or something. It's gibberish, apparently. Um, you see that a lot of the time. It doesn't seem to mean anything that we can tell. Um, but you, yeah, you, you whisper this into, into a bowl. Of course, there's always, a element maybe of, of risk here involved, there might be people all around, and you get a person, person to drink uh, from this uh, improvised potion, and then they will supposedly love you. Or uh, oftentimes it could be carving uh, words or uh, your name into an apple or something and make them eat it. Uh, next slide. This one is curious uh, from uh, um, Bö up in uh, Lofoten, uh, seventeen seventy. 
Take your blood and the blood of a mole and write in your hand her name and your name. Give her th uh, then your hand and say these words. Give yours with my love, that it might be so intertwined as mine and the blood of the mole is intermingled. In the name of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, what's interesting here is that, uh, well, this grimoire, specifically, uh, this one, is very concerned with this animal, um, moles. Uh, it has recipes for capturing moles, uh, making contraptions for catching numerous ones, if you catch caught one already, and, and, and turning moles into powder for whatever unspecified reason. And then, of course, this, you know, seducing people with mole blood. Um, moles do not exist in Norway. Uh, so I assume that maybe this uh, traveled in from Denmark or something like that. Uh, linguistically, it, it can be hard to tell because of, you know, the written norm in Norway at this time is like Dano-Norwegian. So, yeah. Next slide. Here's, uh, speaking of, I, I did warn you that there's a lot of bad advice here. Um, this is one of the worst ones. Uh, concerning love, uh, also from the same grimoire. Uh, take two drops of mercury and put it in ale, that she may drink thereof, and say, Love me above others in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. Yeah, again, please do not do this. Uh, if you do, I want no part in it. Um, next slide. Falling out of love is not something that is often uh, touched upon in the grimoires. Uh, but we do have a couple of cases like this. Uh, this is a recipe to make, uh, I don't know, a, a magical weapon uh, that you can use to break up uh, relationships uh, if you're a killjoy of that sort, or you want want to, maybe you're jealous, uh, jealous of somebody or something. I don't know. Uh, I think this is from the same grimoire that I had a um, a picture of the front uh, front of uh, earlier. So, an art of casting scorn between lovers. Uh, when you see two dogs hanging around with each other, take a stick or rapier and stab and strike between them until they are separated. Whichever couple you strike between with this stick or rapier, after that day they will immediately be the greatest repulsion. There will uh, immediately be the greatest repulsion between them, as if they were cat and dog. So there you have that. Um, if we go over to the next slide, uh, we will see something a little bit more typical. Uh, and uh, something that is definitely quite ancient. Um, one thing that is more common, and I, you know, I took some uh, took some kind of interpretative license here, um, is that one reason why you don't usually see that many uh, charms for specific, like you know, to counter specific sorts of spells, is because they already had charms that did that and then some. Uh, in the form of prayers and and specific metrical charms against all sorts of evil, you know. So in this case, there's a there's an all catch all charms against sorcery that specifically mentions love in many different forms, uh, which we can discuss a little bit afterwards. So this is a metrical charm. We have these uh, from the continent during you know what would in Scandinavia be the Viking Age, for instance, um, and and it's just a just a very old and strange way of kind of phrasing things so jesus the son of god stood at the beach and was met by the foul stench i shall bless you said jesus from troll flowers and soil flowers from troll love and soil love from seer love and graveyard love i shall conjure it from tissue to soil from beast to stone and flesh to wood rot it shall slumber and weaken words of god and amen so uh I don't know what the flowers are about here necessarily, but uh, I think that troll love is, of course, um, supernatural uh, at attention from the, say, the hidden folk or other kind of subterranean entities, uh, which are known in legends to fall in love with uh, with uh, with people, hopelessly and tragically in love with people, and nothing good can come of it. You know, so uh, if you know if um, uh, it's what does it say? It said about you know, you know uh, pretty girls are sick and tired of being, you know, looked at all the time and uh, being, being, a, you know, being a girl, generally speaking, in, in, uh, in pre-modern times was often a dangerous thing, uh, naturally or supernaturally. So troll love, that's, um, that's probably like trolls and hidden folk, hilder people. And then there's soil love. 
and and graveyard love probably refers to uh, ghosts and and the dead. So uh, seer love, I don't know, sorcerers maybe, I don't know. Uh, next slide. So in the uh, final category, sundry and sorted. Um, that's uh, where I put all of the uh, all of the other stuff. A lot of this is contraceptive spells, of course, which you know that's uh, something that people would be interested in back then. And we have two different uh, versions here uh, from the same area. And um, one is uh, that a mage should not become pregnant by taking a stick uh, of flying rowan and fix it to her to her clothes. Uh, flying rowan is. Uh, is a rowan tree that has grown uh, without ever touching the ground directly, uh, which sounds like a paradox, but it's quite easy to make. Because uh, rowan trees are, you know, the berries are eaten by birds, and they they leave the seeds in their droppings, and often, especially with traditional forestry, uh, they would, uh, um, the seeds would start growing in, in bigger and older trees, um, especially uh, trees, you know, which, which have like, maybe like, um, that, that have like grooves and cuts in them from from forestry or or dead old trees and stuff like that. So this was a sought after magical ingredient, especially for you know things that uh, are to protect against magic or things that are supposed to go fast for whatever reason. Uh, the other one is very simple and more scientific: remedy against becoming with child. Give her mercury. Please, please do not do this. Um, again, illustrates uh, that this is a uh, somewhere between the modern period and the medieval period in both of these examples so next slide um i don't know what to call these virgin charms these are very abundant in the so-called black books they were clearly very interested in uh, knowing whether a, a woman was um, a, a virgin or not um and I, this this one is a little bit different than the others, though. Uh, to make a candle that no maid may light unless her virginity is intact. This sounds more like a prank or something. But you take wax, myrrh, and frankincense, clearly some kind of biblical illusion there, uh, and make from this a candle, probatum est, it says that works. Uh, so uh, make that make a candle out of this, light it up, and, and if she's not a virgin, she can't put it out. Uh, next slide. If a maid is a virgin or not, Take the blood of a hare and throw it in the fire. Then they will wet themselves who do not have their virginity. Uh, this doing something, uh, often like throwing something in a fire or saying some certain words, uh, then non-virgins will feel a, an acute need to, to, uh, to urinate or outright wet themselves there and then. It's, it's kind of a baffling uh, sort of charm that I do not really have any explanation for because it seems to me to be one of the more obvious ones that seems to me would not work. I can understand a lot of the ones about so-called hoog venting, you know, turning mind, uh, where you might whisper something into a tankard of ale and give it to somebody. At the very least, that might give you uh, a boost in confidence that uh, that allows you to get go the extra mile, you know, you feel more charming if you think psychologically that this is going to work, or even it could, it could even uh, maybe, let's say that somebody else um, already is interested in you, and and that and a, a love spell might actually uh, be a way to kind of dispel any doubts that, that that you feel the same way and are interested. Maybe I don't know, uh, but these. It's very difficult to understand exactly how this how this worked, uh, but people clearly believed that this uh, had some kind of function. Um, maybe they didn't work, uh, and it just puts people's minds at ease. And and yeah, maybe that's for the best. I don't know. Uh, next slide. Some of the ones that I put in this section are straight up baffling. Uh, in other ways, um, to make a cock sit on a hen as long as you desire. Uh, Take your knife and stick it in the earth when the cock sits on the hen. Then he shall sit on the hen for as long as you want. Um, maybe there's an agricultural reason for this. Um, it, um, maybe it aids the fertilization of eggs or something like that, if you want more chickens. Uh, or maybe they thought that it did. It doesn't say why you want to do this, but I mean, 
sometimes uh, the charms in the black books are straight up parlor tricks for um, or you know stuff you do to amaze your friends or whatever. Um, next slide, I think we might be. Oh yeah, there's this classic, of course. Uh, against troll in the in the nature, um, keep the member in strong liquor often. Um, very laconic. It doesn't. It leaves a lot to the imagination, and I think maybe that's for the best. Uh, there are a few uh, charms like this, like uh, like a, like a proven remedy to strengthen the secret member. There's one called, which calls for toxic uh, blister beetles uh, that you're supposed to anoint. Uh, uh, yourself with uh and and that's supposed to help um i think i'd rather not to be honest but uh yeah next slide i think uh yeah uh well we're done with the charms basically but i was asked to do kind of a palate cleanser at the end uh of uh beer bowl rhymes uh and i think it's kind of fitting because um um i mean as you've seen, some of these charms were clearly intended to be performed at uh, at drinking parties and that sort of thing in in, in discretion. And uh, starting in kind of the in the 1700s, uh, as the aforementioned literacy began to spread, we see a lot of people using more text in folk art and such. And uh, uh, the way that people drank before uh, village doctors started appearing in uh, in um, the Norwegian countryside was that you would have literally beer bowls, like communal bowls, uh, much like this, um, often quite larger, sometimes smaller if if you're actually drinking uh, liquor. And um, uh, they uh, they would sometimes um, inscribe these bowls with um, with uh, little rhymes. Uh, these could be either straight up kind of biblical blessings, you know, kind of like, you know, God be with you sort of stuff. Or they could be, uh, you know, uh, more comedic, humorous, um, have a bit of like, uh, like a little bit of ro romance, especially if they're like, maybe if it's a beer bowl that was made as a wedding gift or something like that. Um, but sometimes they are amusing to the point of being kind of sardonic, almost, almost like threatening the drinker a little bit. Uh, but this one is quite jovial. Drink of me, both stor and small, or bear me till turn, so shall you more for. Drink for me all, both great and little. Carry me to the cask for another tipple. Uh, so this is one. This one. This is the one from. Uh, yeah, this is the actual bowl area that you see in the picture from Fleck and Field, eighteen fifty one. Next slide. And I thought that this one was very. Uh, very nice. This is clearly for uh, hard liquor, like you're drinking maybe Aquavit. Moonshine was quite popular. I come from a line of moonshiners uh, myself. Well, line is maybe an exaggeration. My, my dad dabbled in it when he was younger. <laughs> but uh, this one, this little guy, is uh, small but fierce. He says, I am small. And in due time, I'll make you drunk. So, yeah. Um, if you're curious about uh, more, um, I have some some web websites where I usually post. I'm on social media at at Brute Norse. Um, on the next slide here, yes, you can see here. Uh, there's a there's a small uh, but complicated link on the bottom here. Link dot ee slash Brute Norse. That's where I put generally most of the relevant links to social media and stuff like that. I got brutenorse.com, which I'm horribly bad at uh, keeping up to date, but I'm on Instagram also at, at brutenorse. So yeah, that's me. If, uh, if you're, if you're interested in following, please, please do. And I was going to yeah. say, we will also include links to those in the email that comes out at the end. So folks can just click and find you. Wonderful. Yes. Well, this was fascinating, and we've got some great questions coming in. Jane, do you have one? Yes. So we are we are opening up the floor to questions. Please use the Q and A function to submit your questions. Andrew and I will go back and forth with Eric and do our best to pose as many as we can. We've got a couple here now. 
Um, Irena would like to know, how much do priests effectively behaving or being perceived as magicians or sorcerers do you think could be attributed to the need to indoctrinate Christianity to the masses? Was there still some major tug of war in the Norwegian popular cultures between the old ways and the new ways? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think in the period we're talking about, I don't think that people really needed to be indoctrinated much. I think that they were quite uh, quite religious <laughs> on their own at that point. But there is there is always uh, in in Norwegian folklore this kind of uh, uh, this tug of war between, uh, if not the old ways, at least like what is perceived as being, how should I say, pagan or heretical now, you know. And uh, so, um, of course, people people did uh, have this idea that you can go out to uh, less than sacred powers and um, and petition them uh, if uh, other, you know, if for help that that the priests or the church could not um, could not help with. And certainly, they often uh, there were often cases where people thought that well, it can't hurt to hedge your bets. And 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 you know do certain things that the priest might not uh, approve of. They didn't necessarily think of this as being unchristian necessarily, but just more kind of I don't know, um, uh, just a fact of the human condition. I think you know it's just we're we're living in a dangerous world with all sorts of things uh, between heaven and hell. So, um, but yeah, that's a it's a great question. They they generally just considered um, um, the clergy to be. Um, they, they consider the clergy to be ambiguous. You know, we we can sometimes say, well, sometimes the church, uh, you know, there are have always been corrupt church officials or whatever. There have been good and bad priests, and these people were, of course, aware of that. Uh, and so they, so so the 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 priests are sometimes, you know, themselves kind of am, am, ambiguous figures. But another part of this, of course, is that they would often be the only literate people around, and so the priest often had to act both as village doctor and veterinarian and, and stuff like that so um and and actually i didn't mention this but sometimes it seems that uh that kind of folk healer role might have uh, been sometimes associated with the with the priest's uh spouse so protestant clergymen you know they had wives and uh, sometimes uh, they might have performed that kind of extra role uh, and which is interesting because we do have cases where um, uh, the wives of clergy are accused of witchcraft. Um, and we also have witchcraft, you know, court cases where people uh, are accused uh, of uh, of teaching sorcery to uh, to young theology students and stuff like that. So this is definitely kind of a complicated, complicated world back then. Um, yeah, good question. Excellent. Avadan is asking, in the 16th to 18th century, how difficult would it have been for someone to obtain, for example, mercury for a spell? Was the difficulty of obtaining ingredients, would that be proportional to the difficulty of the spell? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, like, uh, th those were times where, like, <clears throat> Uh, regulation was, you know, uh, based on straight, strictly upon like availability, not like today where you, you, there are controlled substances that you're not allowed to buy over the counter or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that might be, uh, yeah, that might be a factor sometimes in these, like that the ingredients are exotic and, and deemed therefore to be automatically uh, more like powerful or effective or something. Uh, we, I don't really have a source for this, but, uh, I remember, uh, as a tour guide, uh, at the Bryggen in, in Bergen, I think the Hanseatic Museum has, uh, um, has like in one of their like old, like shipping manifests or something like that, they have access to a document where somebody ordered, uh, dried bats or something. And it's like strictly <laughs> hush, hush, you know, it's like, um, we, we do have sometimes letters where people, um, where people write uh, uh, merchants and stuff like that, asking specifically for ingredients that seem to be uh, seem seem a little bit suspicious. I might put it that way, uh, but definitely, like there were, uh, you know, uh, trading networks going all the way down to to um, to the continent, and 
the first uh, Scandinavian black books probably were translated from German uh, originally and then acculturated to um, and adapted to local tradition as they traveled. Yeah. Great. Okay, we have another one that just came in from SJ. Hello, Eric. This was wonderful. I am curious about how you work with and alongside oral history. When we have access to such lore, what is the line between dramatization and daily life? Does it matter? I, for one, love cats coming through keyholes, a constant in Atlantic Canadian folklore, but how does it challenge your practice or not at all? Do we as historians have a say? Yeah, I don't know if we have a say. I'm very like radically accepting of 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 just you know the weirdness of the material, and I'm just really delighted uh, about like when I when I see um, in a lot of the narratives that like the the legendary uh, like mumbo jumbo surrounding the black books and stuff like that. Um, how it's always it's always about unlikelihoods, right? You know, it's. Uh, when a when a when a wizard or something like that gets or witch um gets help to do something they like it's not like in the movies where there's like a big you know flaming goat or some scary animal it's like a duck or a rooster who's like pulling all the weight or something like that something that is like abs utterly absurd and that makes it like more eerie and 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 odd um from like i don't know like a, a practice point of view i think just like i don't know lean into the weirdness and uh like i you know, I'm on the, on the one hand, you know, it's it can seem odd to navigate um, navigate all of this kind of from like a source critical, rational, academic perspective today. Um, but I think you know, just uh, you know, just just uh, allow yourself to be playful with it and, and can lean into the to the to the funny absurdity to it. I think somehow that's those two things managed to coexist with me at least. So uh, I'm sure for many others, it must be the same uh, too. So I don't know if that answered the question at all, but hopefully. Absolutely, yeah. I'm curious personally, you mentioned that moles don't exist in Norway, but they turn up in that particular grimoire with great yeah. frequency. Are there any other ingredients that turn up in specific things that clearly would have had to be imported or clearly told you that that spell came from someplace else? Um, yeah, I mean, plenty. Um, there are some, uh, um, I mean, there are some, some of the spells have parallels that, that are so old, you know, that it's, it's hard to tell, uh, if it's like how long it's been locally, but there are other ones that are like, say you find them in great abundance in germany and britain uh and one of them is uh well the ingredient itself is not necessarily exotic but you have to you have to uh, to kill a toad in a certain way uh or a frog depends on the text um you know i don't really know to what extent they necessarily differentiated between frogs and toads uh from area to area um, but you have to do it in a very indirect way. You're not supposed to hear the toad scream or whatever. I don't, yeah. And, um, but you're, you're supposed to, to get the toad killed, but you're not supposed to do it yourself. I think that's the thing. And, uh, there's, uh, there's a hook shaped bone apparently, uh, that you can use, um, sometimes in, in traditions abroad, this gives you power to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, in, in clearly in Norway, it's just, uh, it's just the power to 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 uh, you know to banally uh, just seduce someone as if you hook it to their clothing or something like that. So it's like it's a limited function there. Uh, but uh, yeah, in other cases, uh, a lot of like Spanish fly stuff like that is one thing that reoccurs. Uh, yeah, I mean these people were connected uh, to the to the world around them via trading centers. Some more than others, of course. Uh, yeah. Hey, Ray says many of the spells referenced in your book are from the mid and late 19th century during the area of Norwegian mass migration to the United States. Have you investigated the persistence of folk magic in a Norwegian American context? I can recommend a really specific book here, but I'm curious as to what you're going to say. 
Uh, well, I think that uh, I was going to suggest the same book, actually. Uh, I have not looked into this. Um, there is... Uh, recently, there were... There were um, uh, what was it? Could it have been two grimoires? Uh, there was... Well, there was a grimoire material that was recently discovered um, uh, uh, attached to a Norwegian-American uh, so it was, um so she got this translated and released. It's called the Black Books of Elverum or something like that. Uh, so that's, uh, yes, indirect. That's in Norway, but there is a book um, that is, uh, is it this the, yeah, I mean, Remedies and Rituals. Is that the one you were talking about? Yeah, this one gets into that. Uh, it's really cool. It, it gets into all of that uh, stuff that I was not uh aware of before i got it um i bought it i think right after i released mine uh but yeah it gets into uh into that uh into that whole tradition uh of of you know vernacular transmission uh in the diaspora and of course oh, so the editor and translator of that one uh that's uh kathleen stalker perfect yeah perfect Folk Medicine in Norway and the New Land. It's called, that's the subtitle. Great. Well, we are running out of time, which is hard to believe because it's been a lightning fast hour, but a huge thank you to you, Eric, for today's event. And thanks to everybody for attending.